Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to our day two keynote opening session. And uh, I, had a, I had a great day yesterday. <laughs> Went into the vendor room, there's like Crafty Bear or Turbo Panda looking at me. It's like, I'm back at Black Hat. It's pretty cool creativity. Hey, so before we kick off our keynote, I've got a couple of normal housekeeping announcements and a couple more thoughts I'm gonna subject you to. Um, first off, um, the materials for all the sessions uh, will be online next week. So when you get home from the conference, you recover over the weekend if you're not at DEF CON, check out the Black Hat site and the YouTube channel and you'll start to see all the materials becoming available. And then don't forget that your badge also gets you access online for 30 days uh, for the session. So you can also stream it, have a party at your house with your friends and watch your favorite sessions again or catch up on the things you didn't see. So that's the housekeeping. And then this evening, um, we'll have an ending keynote um, by the Secretary of DHS. Now, it had been planned that both Jen and the Secretary were going to be live and on the beginning of the week, here we are at the end of the week and they're not live. So that wasn't the plan, I apologize for that, but stuff happens and we just have to adapt and overcome. So, like yesterday, I'm gonna be doing um, an introduction Jen's gonna give her talk, then we're gonna to go to a Q&A session just like we did with Matt yesterday. All right, so that's the plan. Let's get started. Now, many of you who've seen me talk up on stage before have heard me say this over and over again, and I'm probably gonna keep repeating it for at least another five years, which is that internet problems are global problems. And I say this because it's sometimes a small-minded kind of well, the tech was invented in America, and there's a fang of the giant companies are in America, and the English-speaking world, and we just sort of don't realize that the equipment that runs a lot of the internet doesn't come from America. Right? The engineers are in different countries, and that really, if there is a problem in some of the infrastructure, you're probably going to have to talk to someone in another country, or at least deal with products manufactured in another country, or standards that were largely developed in another country, like 5G. So we have to have a, a bigger global mindset. And we also have to do this for another reason, I think, and, and that is that the, the internet is really shaping up to be sort of this contested environment, right, where we're really seeing some soft lines in the sand being drawn, and it's, it's really going down sort of the rule of law countries, um, this undecided sort of neutral countries in the middle that don't have to pick or don't want to pick sides, and then sort of the more authoritarian countries. And that might be very nebulous and soft now, but I guarantee you over the next five years, those lines are gonna become bigger and taller. Lines in the sand will become moats in the sand. And both sides, the rule of law countries and the authoritarian countries are gonna start squeezing and pressuring the people in the middle, right? The undecided countries are gonna be kind of forced to try to take, take sides. And so from my perspective, hey, I wanna showcase, I'm on team rule of law, and I really wanna showcase the strengths of rule of law, right? The, the independence, the freedom uh, of decision making, the, the personal choice, um, but you have to set a positive example. You have to show that team rule of law can get stuff done. And if ransomware attacks or other attacks are crushing us, hey, we have a way of solving these problems that don't mean we have to become team authoritarian, right? Our model will work for the challenges that the internet is facing. We created the internet and we are gonna figure out the solutions to the problems it presents. Even if there's bad actors poking us all the time, trying to push us over or trying to make us look more like them, right? Because that helps their argument. And so we're gonna have to work together to fix these problems. We're gonna have to coordinate with each other, right? We're gonna have loose alliances, we're gonna have opportunistic, but we're gonna have to sort of do this more purposefully. We're gonna have to know that we're not just doing it for our company or for ourselves, but we're doing it for the future, the type of internet we wanna leave our children. Right? Because the internet is so malleable that if we screw this up, long enough, it'll just become a different kind of internet, and one that maybe we're not so proud of. 
So yesterday I also talked a little bit about um, community immunity and this idea that can you get a conferred benefit on a network if one network is really locked down and really secured, do other networks get a benefit, maybe through anti-spam or DNSSEC type records? Well, I'm just gonna talk about that a little bit more from a different perspective. So, community immunity, it's what's considered, it's part of a social dilemma, a, a set of problems that social scientists and psychologists study. And in the social dilemma set of problems, there's generally three that people study, and you're probably familiar with two of them. The first one is the prisoner's dilemma. It's like in every movie and every TV show that wants to appear smart, you know, the cops separate the witnesses or the suspects and they have a prisoner's dilemma moment where the person turns the camera and explains the prisoner's dilemma to the audience. And that's largely around self-interest. If the two, uh, suspects stay quiet, that's their optimal solution. But if either one of them cooperates or both cooperate, they have a worse outcome. Then there's a tragedy of the commons. And in the tragedy of the commons, the questions largely revolve around who maintains the commons. And so you might say, well, is the internet a commons and who's responsible for maintaining it? Um, but it's largely around an open resource, a field, uh, a stadium that everybody has access to. And the one that you might be less familiar with is the public goods dilemma. And the public goods dilemma is largely um, around a resource. So think of um, fishermen um, trying to optimize their rate of catching fish. And so if every fisherman catches all the fish they possibly can, there'd be no more fish and so it would hurt the community of fishermen. So um, social dilemmas are defined by two characteristics in tension with each other. The first is each person designs their own optimum strategy to maximize their situation, right? Oh, I've got uh, free internet, I'm gonna download everything. I'm gonna use all the bandwidth. I'm gonna maximize and optimize for my return. And the thing it's in tension with is the second part. If everybody does this, everybody is worse off. Right? And in that situation, cooperation is the better strategy. So it's the cooperation versus the individual maximizer is the problem. And so in the public's good dilemma, there's one you're probably familiar with um, called the free rider problem. And the free rider problem is essentially you're providing a service uh, so, for example, New York subway. Um, if five or ten people jump over the stiles, not a problem. New York subway will still operate. But if everybody jumps over the stiles and nobody pays for the subway, subway will go broke. Right? So it can absorb a little bit, but it can't absorb everybody doing it. And I like to think of sort of the economic model of the internet today, driven by ad revenue. If a couple of us install ad blockers, not a big deal. If we all install ad blockers, that's a big deal, right? That fundamentally changes the whole economic model of the internet. That would be uh, sort of a, a free rider problem. And so it's this tension between the short-term self-interest versus long-term collective interest. And this is sort of a problem that we're gonna be facing in the internet, uh, or are facing currently. And I think traditionally the way these problems get solved is the individuals take care of themselves, we all pursue our own self-interest, but when it comes to collective interest, that's why we formed governments. Right? That's traditionally the role of governments, sometimes companies. And so generally the, comp the governments would then legislate. They would say, okay, Columbia River, this is how you get to divvy up your water resources. It's not whoever's most upstream gets all the water, you have to divide it amongst the interested states. Right? Or um, you don't have to be your own fire department, we're gonna form a fire department, tax people, and then if there's a fire, the collective will help put out the fire. Right? These are certain problems governments do better than individuals or companies. And we're starting to see this become uh, in relief in internet security. We're starting to face certain problems that are beyond the individual or the company to solve, or the IETF or ICANN or whoever, there, there are certain classes of problems that are really starting to become governmental problems. 
right? If it's a nation state that's fucking with us and we don't have a governmental response, problem's not gonna get solved, right? So the government has to step up and they have to acknowledge that they're the only one in certain categories that can solve these collective issue problems and they have to work with us to come up with the optimum solution. And so I think what we, have to think of, what we have to think about is how do we build these relationships? Who do we trust in government? Who do we not trust? What's worth building, what's not? What norms are worth building and what ones are we not going to pursue? And so I'm really excited to introduce Jen Easterly, who's the new sworn in director of CISA at DHS, um, who's really interested in building community and it'll be up to us to decide if we you know, participate, but this is the kind of initiative that governments would traditionally engage in. Right? They would come to the subject matter experts. They would say, hey, listen, we have a certain set of authorities, we can do these things, you can do those things, how are we together going to solve some of these problems? Because we're not gonna be able to solve it alone, and especially not with pressure from team authoritarian that's gonna be poking us at just the worst time in the worst place. Right? We have to acknowledge are these real challenges, and despite the mythology that we can build the internet alone and run the internet alone, we're gonna have to actually participate in a more uh, of a larger collective if we wanna see the internet remain more open and accessible. So, a little bit about Jen. She's kind of done everything in, in the government. She um, is interesting, a past keynote speaker, Black Hat, um, uh, Jane Lute actually was her teacher at West Point. And so it's sort of like one generation uh, educating another. And so Jen was in the US Army for 20 years and was a professor of social sciences at the United States Military Academy. Uh, and then in 2002 to 2004, she was an executive assistant to the National Security Advisor. Um, she was, in 2004 to 2006, she was a battalion executive officer and brigade operations officer at the United States Army Intelligence and Security Command. And then more uh, recently, with the cyber experience, 2009, 2010, she was at the United States Cyber Command and helped stand up that command. From 2010 to 11, she was a cyber advisor for the National Security Advisor, uh, stationed in Kabul. And then she retired from the Army uh, as a lieutenant colonel and then served as the deputy director for the NSA, National Security Advisor for Counterterrorism. And then in 2013 to 2016, she was a special assistant to President uh, Obama and senior director for counterterrorism on the National Security Council. And at the very end, after the administration, she went into the private sector, probably for the first time, uh, and became the global head of the cybersecurity division for Morgan Stanley and now has come back into government uh, just this last month as the CISA director. And she's gonna highlight the scope and scale of threats to our cyber infrastructure and how hackers, the government, and the private sector can work together to try to secure the nation from these threats. So, I'm interested in hearing her story of how she got to where she is and, uh, and her thoughts on what CISA can possibly do to help us. So, take it away, Jen, thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff, for that kind introduction. I'm Jen Easterly. I'm the director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and I'm so honored to be a part of Black Hat. It's one of my first official duties since I was sworn in uh, some three and a half weeks ago. And as part of that, I want to lay to rest what I am told is a hotly debated topic, and that is the pronunciation of my agency. It's CISA. 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 Seriously, it's not that hard. It is pronounced CISA. But seriously, I am really honored and thrilled to be with you here today because I need your help. But before I start making demands of you, I figured I should introduce myself a little bit so you get to know me and hopefully appreciate uh, where I come from, what's important to me, how I plan to lead CISA, and most importantly, how I wanna partner with all of you. Now, I know you're gonna find this really hard to believe, but I was a bit of a nerdy kid. 
Uh, so I wasn't very good at sports. I wasn't very popular. Uh, I did well in school. I played piano pretty poorly. But the thing that I loved most were puzzles and games, card games, board games, video games. And at the age of 11, I became obsessed with the Rubik's Cube. Now, you may know that the Rubik's Cube was invented by Hungarian sculptor Erno Rubik in the year 1974, but it wasn't introduced into the world until 1980, and it caused, of course, an international sensation. And as I said, I became obsessed with solving it. And so I spent quite a while, and I finally figured it out. Uh, and then much to the amusement of my parents, I would go around to toy stores in the local area and toy stores when we would travel, and I would make a bet with the toy store clerk or the owner that if I could solve the cube in less than two minutes, then they would give me a free one. Now, I know you can go on YouTube today and see a two-year-old solving the Rubik's Cube with her toes in 11.4 seconds, but back then, two minutes was a really big deal. I mean, it took Erno Rubik a full month to solve the cube, and he invented the thing. So, you know, after a while, I was able to amass a pretty good collection of cubes, but this love of puzzles really stayed with me throughout my career and manifested into a love for problem solving. So fast forward a couple years later, just after my 18th birthday, I did what most nice Jewish girls from middle-class families do. I went off to the United States Military Academy at West Point. Okay. None of my classmates did that. I was the only one. But in addition to growing up with a love for puzzles, I grew up with a real deep appreciation of public service. My dad was a Vietnam veteran. Both my parents served in government. And I felt that it was really important to serve the nation. I knew I wanted to be in the Army. I wanted to go to West Point. Uh, so I headed off there in the summer of 1986. I was part of the 10th class of women to enter West Point. We were just about 9% of the population. Interestingly, we were the first class of cadets to be, uh, to be issued computers, the mighty Zenith Z248. So again, showed up in the summer of 1986. Now, I had applied early. I had been accepted early, but I made a very serious error. I had never visited the school. So when I showed up in that summer hot day, I was ill-prepared for the physical rigors, the mental stresses, the emotional pressures. I remember I showed up, they took away my civilian clothes, gave me a white t-shirt with my last name, these ugly black acrylic shorts with gold piping, uh, black socks, we had to pull up to our knees, black leather shoes, they hacked off my hair, I failed my first two mile run, and I got yelled at a lot. And every night I thought about quitting and going home, but every morning, I recommitted myself to improving and getting through that difficult summer. I was really looking at it as a puzzle to be solved. And this time, it was actually more enjoyable because I was solving it with a group of teammates. So I was able to get through that difficult summer and made it four years through West Point, graduated in 1990. It was the end of the Cold War. Those four years in minoring in Russian didn't seem so smart anymore. It was the self-proclaimed end of history, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, the triumph of the liberal international order over communism and autocracy. Peace was breaking out all over. And I thought I'd only be in the army for a few years and I'd get out and do something else. But over the next 10 years, the opportunities that I had to be on peacekeeping operations in Haiti and in Bosnia, to be a paratrooper, jumping out of airplanes at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, the excitement, the challenges of leadership, the many puzzles and problems to be solved really kept me in the Army. And I found myself back at West Point 10 years after graduating, teaching economics and security to cadets. And I was there on September 11th. And I remember that morning, I was getting ready to teach a class to cadets who until that bright, beautiful Tuesday, thought they'd be graduating into a world where the army would likely shrink in size and they'd spend most of their time planning or doing exercises. And then the planes hit in New York, in Washington, D.C., in a field in Pennsylvania, and the world changed, as we all know. I remember watching the towers fall on TV, hundreds of floors of steel and glass exploding in the air, signaling the deaths of thousands. 2,977 people died that day from 90 countries around the world. And then just a few years later, I found myself sitting behind my then boss, National Security Advisor, 
Condoleezza Rice as she was testifying before the 9-11 Commission that was set up to investigate the government's failure to prevent those attacks. And I remember being struck by the words of the co-chairman of the 9-11 Commission, Tom Kane, who said, on that September day, we were unprepared. We did not grasp the magnitude of a threat that had been growing for some considerable amount of time. It was a failure of policy, a failure of management, a failure of capability, but above all, a failure of imagination. I was totally struck by that. And you know, Albert Einstein has said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited while imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. He warned, do not sacrifice your imagination on the altar of crude reality. You'll wind up believing in nothing and having worthless dreams. Now, I have to say I agree with that. I believe that imagination is more important than knowledge. You know, we sometimes dismiss those of wild imagination as these impractical dreamers who waste our time, but as those of wild, ima wild imagination who've given us our most important and impactful inventions. Light and flight and power and code, who've put a woman in space, who've allowed us to communicate instantaneously with others around the globe. It's those of wild imagine, imagination who've helped us solve our most complicated puzzles. Imagination brings resilience and innovation. It makes us better leaders, makes us better technologists, makes us better hackers. So I've spent the last decades of my career honing my own imagination to try and build technologies and teams to deal with the most serious threats to the nation from terrorists and cyber threat actors. And I want to tell you a little bit about that journey. So again, you know who I am and how I want to partner with you. And I want to take you to the year 2007 in Baghdad. I was a young lieutenant colonel in the army. I was deployed there with the National Security Agency uh, as part of our effort to bring national level intelligence to the troops on the ground. It was the height of the violence uh, during the surge. Uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq had, had perfected their ability to make these bombs out of improvised explosive devices, and it was having catastrophic impacts on Iraqi civilians and our troops on the ground. And one of the things that my team and I were asked to do was to operationalize this new high technology platform called Real Time Regional Gateway, or RTRG. Uh, it was highly classified at the time, uh, declassified a couple years ago. And the idea was we were trying to take all of the collection available from traditional streams of intel like satellite and cell phones to reporting about insurgent activity on the ground to take all of that data together and enrich it and integrate it and correlate it to help us illuminate terrorist networks not in weeks or days but in hours and minutes. Uh, my team sat in a van in a base in the middle of Baghdad, violence all around, trying to code up the system. I used to think of it as extreme coding. Uh, and I will tell you, there were many, many failures in that first month as we tried to get the system up and running, but there was no failure of imagination. There was actually a really strong presence of it with that great team. And after a while, we were able to successfully get the system up and running, and it provided a capability to the troops on the ground that help them to take thousands of insurgents off the battlefield and save lives. And to me, it was an epiphany. It was really uh, the power of technology and the power of imagination and the power of collaboration uh, really hit home for me. The power of all of that to actually save lives and make a difference for the nation. Now, a few months after I redeployed from Baghdad, the director of the National Security Agency at the time, General Keith Alexander, asked me to stand up the Army's first Cyber Operations Battalion. And my team and I did that in the summer of 2008. We called it the Army Network Warfare Battalion. Now, a few months after that, the military, the Department of Defense, suffered its most devastating cyber attack when an infected thumb drive was inserted into a laptop at a base in the Middle East, allowing malicious code to spiral through networks and for sensitive data to be exfiltrated. And it was a huge wake-up call that the military really needed to maneuver differently in this new domain called cyberspace and that it would require a new type of organization that would bring together offensive cyber capabilities with defensive ones. 
And because I was the Army Cyber Battalion Commander, I was asked to be part of this very small team to help build this new organization. It was me, it was Colonel Paul Nakasone from the Army, Captain TJ White from the Navy, Colonel S.L. Davis uh, from the Air Force, working for General Alexander, and our then uh, NSA Deputy Director, Chris Inglis, uh, now our National Cyber Director, uh, a fantastic teammate and collaborator who is already adding value to helping to secure our cyber ecosystem. So we all worked together uh, to build what eventually became United States Cyber Command. And of course, Cyber Command and NSA under the command of now General Paul Nakasone and NSA's Cyber Directorate under the leadership of my good friend Rob Joyce are close partners with CISA. Now, a few years later, there was another series of major cyber attacks. This time it was a distributed, uh, distributed denial of service attack by a group called the Al-Qassam Cyber Fighters. And essentially these DDoS attacks were launched against all of the big banks across Wall Street so that customers and clients and employees couldn't get to those websites. And it really caused a panic. For the first time it illuminated the fragility and vulnerability of our critical financial infrastructure. And it led early on to the banks coming together and realizing that they needed to build those capabilities to enable them to deal with this increasingly complex cyber threat network. And the bank that I would later join was one of those who started building those capabilities. And so in 2017, after I left the government, I went to go join Morgan Stanley to help build and lead our global cybersecurity fusion center to understand, detect, and respond to cyber threats and vulnerabilities that would impact the firm, our networks, our clients, our reputation. And so we built that capability out over a period of three years. And then at the end of 2019, we were actually asked to expand on that platform to build what we called the Fusion Resilience Center, bringing together our cyber response capabilities, technology incident management, intelligence, exercises, business continuity, technology disaster recovery, to enable us to understand, prepare for, respond to, recover, and learn from any sort of operational incident that could disrupt the firm, from cyber attacks to cyber-enabled fraud, to technology incidents, to terrorist attacks, to geopolitical unrest, to infectious disease and pandemics. Now, I think three important things to think about this change. First is the idea of this hybrid threat landscape. You can't just talk about cyber attacks or geopolitics or pandemics. All of these things are coming together to create this very hybrid threat environment. And COVID is a perfect example of a global health crisis that's also a cyber pandemic because entrepreneurial cyber threat actors took advantage of so many people working remotely in an explosion of fraud and theft. But you think about point two, right? It's this idea of the convergence of the cyber and physical. Everything runs on this technology back backbone in this incredibly digitized world we live in. The cyber and the physical are coming together. And so we have to treat these things as one integrated problem set. And then finally, this idea of resilience. All of us want to prevent bad things from happen happening. Of course we do. But in this complicated world that we live in, it's increasingly difficult to prevent bad things from happening, particularly when you have highly dedicated and sophisticated cyber threat actors. So the key is you have to build a system where you can we, where you can detect this activity as rapidly as possible, you can respond to it, and you re can recover to mitigate risk to your business and to the nation. So this whole idea of the importance of resilience. So we built out that capability, uh, and for four and a half years, I really gained this incredible appreciation for the importance of ensuring the security and resilience of a piece of our critical financial infrastructure. And that's really what motivates me to come back today uh, to government to work as the director of CISA. So you know, here we are in 2021, world is highly complex, but you know, I think back about to that point in 2007 when I was in Baghdad, and we thought at that period of time we were dealing with this massive amount of data, but it's, it's kind of funny when I look back because it was really just the beginning. Because of course, 2007 was the year that Steve Jobs introduced the world to the first iPhone, sparking a revolution in communication technology. It was also the year that a small microblogging platform called Twitter began to spin off and scale globally, following in the footsteps of Facebook, which had just become available to 
everybody over the age of 13 with a valid email address a few months earlier. But 2007 was also the year that storage capacity for computing exploded with the emergence of Hadoop. It was the year that development began on GitHub, the year that Change.org was incorporated, the year that Amazon released Kindle and Google released Android and IBM began working on Watson. It was also the year that Intel first introduced non-silicon materials into microchips, enabling the continued growth and exponential computing power. Now here we are in 2021. There are 7.8 billion people on the planet, 5.2 billion on mobile phones, 4.7 billion on the internet, 4.3 billion on social media. There are now over 21 billion devices connected to the internet, a number expected to grow considerably in the coming few years. And from the first website in 1991, there are now over 1.8 billion websites. In just one internet minute, there are now more than 572,000 tweets, 1.3 million Facebook logins, 3.4 million snaps sent, 4.7 million YouTube videos watched, 5.5 million Google searches, and over 261 million emails sent and delivered in just one internet minute. The world is incredibly digitized and the volume, variety, and velocity of data is ever expanding. And we know that's a good thing. It's brought us together as humans, it's helped us solve problems, we've improved our quality of life, but as we've attached more platforms and devices on the internet, we have increased the attack surface, as we all know, and we've increased the vulnerabilities. So, now there's a cyber attack roughly every 40 seconds, one in 10 of those 1.8 billion websites leads you to malware, cybercrime damages, are in the trillions of dollars, and as we all know, ransomware has become a scourge affecting all Americans across society with attacks against schools and hospitals and municipalities and pipelines and meatpacking and all manner of software. One particularly pernicious vector are these ransomware attacks against the healthcare sector already highly stressed because of COVID. One, uh, healthcare services, suffered a ransomware attack that cost them about $70 million. But that monetary cost really pales in comparison to the potential human cost because these delays in services and in surgeries and in healthcare can lead to an increase in the number of, of average deaths that happen in a period of time. We cannot allow avoidable cyber disruptions to cost human lives. And yet every day, malicious cyber actors from nation states to cyber criminals weaponize all of that data and the vulnerabilities in our networks to threaten the confidentiality, the integrity, the availability of our information, our privacy, our identity, our security, our critical infrastructure, and frankly, our way of life. And that's what brings me back after four and a half years in the private sector to the U.S. government to lead CISA. We're at an incredible moment of time when we have an administration that has made cybersecurity a national security imperative. And CISA is the product of imagination of many of my predecessors, as well as the U.S. Congress that created it at the end of 2018, where it was founded by my good friend and predecessor, Chris Krebs. Now, CISA was created to be something very different, not just another lumbering government bureaucracy, but really something much more akin to a hybrid public-private collaborative where collaboration is baked into our DNA. Now, our mission statement is pretty simple. We lead the national effort to understand, manage, and mitigate risk to our cyber and physical infrastructure. It's easy to say, but very hard to operationalize with significant consequences for failure. So as the National Coordinator for Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience to realize our vision of secure and resilient infrastructure for the American people, we have to do it as a team. We can't do this alone because over 80% of critical infrastructure is in private hands. So it has to be an effort where we come together and collectively leverage our imagination and our collaboration to help secure our cyber ecosystem. So here's where I ask for your help. First thing, partner with us to raise the cybersecurity baseline 
of our data, of our networks, of our services, of our products, and to help make the internet a safer place. You look back on the year so far, and it's pretty incredible. From the solar wind supply chain hack to the uh, vulnerabilities exploited in uh, Microsoft Exchange Server to vulnerabilities in print, Windows Print Spooler to uh, Pulse Secure Connect to attacks against pipelines and meatpacking and uh, Kaseya software. It's been a pretty incredible year so far, and we're only at the beginning of August. And here's where I need to give my sincere thanks to uh, Brandon Wales, our executive director, who was the acting director of CISA, and our executive assistant director, Eric Goldstein, who really shepherded us through this very turbulent and complex period of time. They and their teams did a fantastic job. Now, CISA was able to issue emergency directives to our federal partners, was able to get out alerts to our network defenders in the larger community to help them uh, mitigate the risks from these vulnerabilities. But CISA was only able to do this because of the incredible partners that we have, in particular, the partnership with the research community that does such great work to help us identify vulnerabilities. And I want to give you a couple examples. Uh, so Victor Gavers of the Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure helped us understand the chain of vulnerabilities that led to the exploitation of Kaseya software and helped us manage uh, a national response. Uh, during Solar Wind, Sean Metcalf of Trimark helped us understand the complications around identity management. And his work has really been foundational to helping to effectively pen test infrastructure. And then Will Dorman of the Software Engineering Institute of Carnegie Mellon helped Microsoft and CISA and our partners understand the past and interconnectedness of the print nightmare vulnerability so that we could get guidance out to enable network defenders to be able to strengthen the security of their networks from that vulnerability. Now, these are just three examples, three recent examples, uh, but there are many, many more. So my thanks to Victor and Sean and to Will and to all of you who have participated in our coordinated vulnerability disclosure platform. You have helped us make the internet and our ecosystem safer. And for those of you who haven't, I invite you to please participate. We are a huge supporter of the research community, the work that you do to help identify vulnerabilities so they can be rapidly mitigated is so foundational to a safe and secure cyber ecosystem. Everyone knows that we are stronger together. Our strength really comes from this incredible power of collaboration. But we know that with great power comes great responsibility. So my priority, one of my big priorities as the director, is to ensure that we are maximizing this power, is to cultivate and strengthen the incredible partnerships that we have, in particular with industry, with the academia, with researchers, with the hacker community, to ensure that we are leveraging the best and brightest of this community for the collective defense of the nation. As I said, collaboration is in CISA's DNA. And I fundamentally believe that this approach will make us stronger. It will, it will also help us uh, to secure the very complicated supply chain that underpins practically everything we do. And that enables our businesses, large and small, to help support our economy. So incredibly important mission. You know, relatedly, another opportunity, last week, we issued the Vulnerability Disclosure Platform. So what this is, is a shared service, service between CISA and our federal government partners to enable the public, like you, to identify vulnerabilities on our government websites and mobile applications, and to enable a place where they can be taken in and triaged and routed to ensure that we can rapidly leverage those vulnerabilities that you have given us to mitigate those vulnerabilities on networks to ensure the security of internet accessible systems. So hugely important capabilities. So I know what you're thinking, right? In addition to helping defend your nation and secure the cybersecurity ecosystem, what's the value in partnering with these CISA people? So let me help you with that. Now, I've only been here for three and a half weeks. But I have seen CISA grow and transform over the last four and a half years as a senior technology and cybersecurity leader in the private sector. And I want to give you three reasons. And if I come back ne next year, I can probably give you many more. But the first one is context. We can provide context to what you are seeing on your network. And as we know, context is for kings. Given where we are placed 
and our relationships with the intel community, the law enforcement community, industry, the federal government, we capture a holistic view of the threat landscape that we can provide to you to enable your understanding. And what's more, given our role in helping to protect and defend federal civilian executive branch networks, we have a very large and unique cache of data that we synthesize and analyze to help put out actionable products and guidance. So this picture that we're able to bring together helps us enable you to understand suspicious activity on your network so that you can rapidly respond to it and mitigate it. So thing number one, context. Thing two, I mentioned the work that we did over the past eight months and uh, for years before that to send out uh, expert cyber incident response teams to help victims recover from cyber attacks. And we stand by uh, to help you if you need it. Now, much of the data that we get from responding to these incidents is anonymized. And we can use that very importantly to help warn other potential victims so that they don't get attacked. This ability to share information as early warning is incredibly important to helping us all defend the cyber ecosystem. And here's where I wanna get on a little bit of my cyber soapbox and talk about these hackneyed terms, right? We all know them, the bumper stickers in cyber, public-private partnerships, information sharing. Well, look, my goal is to really help breathe new life into these arguably hackneyed terms, turning public-private partnership into public-private operational collaboration, and information sharing into something that is timely and relevant, and most importantly, actionable. The information we put out must be able to be used to help network defenders make a decision to strengthen your network. So I ask for your feedback. We and our partners work hard to try and get out products that can be used by you. So please help us refine those products so that they are valuable and indeed are actionable. So third thing, we Given our mission as the Civ Civilian Cyber Defense Agency and all of our important partnerships, we have this incredible platform. The federal government, our close partners at the state, local, tribal, territorial level, our partners with critical infrastructure owners and operators all across industry, gives us this fantastic platform where we can come together and share cyber best practices and we can plan and we can exercise against the most significant cyber threats to the nation. And on that note, I am super excited today to announce that CISA is launching the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. Okay, for those of you Seinfeld fans, that was the Elaine dance. So look, I wanted to call this thing the Advanced Cyber Defense Collaborative, but the lawyers wouldn't let me. But the JCDC, I'm really excited to talk about it. So the JCDC was also the product of imagination of the fantastic Cyberspace Solarium Commission that was led by Senator Angus King and Representative uh, Mike Gallagher. Uh, Chris English, our national cyber director, was also a commissioner there. They have made a significant contribution to the security of the cyber, uh, the cyber ecosystem and to our national cyber strategy. Uh, they came up with this idea of a planning office and then uh, the Congress, in particular the Senate and the House Homeland Security Committees, their incredible leadership as well as the leadership of Congressman Jim Langevin came up with this idea of bringing together the public sector and the private sector in a joint planning capability to help us build plans against the most significant cyber threats to our nation. Now, I'm a retired military officer, so I like to quote dead generals. And one of my favorite is General Eisenhower, who said, plans are nothing, planning is everything. And I really believe that. You have to come together and develop these plans with your stakeholders and partners you got to plan in peacetime so you're ready in wartime. So the whole idea of this JCDC is to bring together our partners to do four key things. First, to share insights so that we create a common operating picture, a shared situational awareness of the threat environment so that we understand it better. Two, to develop 
whole-of-nation comprehensive cyber defense plans to deal with the most significant threats to the nation to include significant threats to our critical infrastructure. Three, to exercise these plans, because again, you've got to exercise in peacetime to be prepared for wartime. You can't make a friend when you need a friend. And then finally, to work together to implement these cyber defense plans into actual operations and make sure that we can do that to reduce risk to the nation. So to some extent, some of these activities are already going on across the federal government, but they're happening largely in stovepipes. So the idea is we bring together our partners in the government and our private sector partners together to really mature this planning capability. And that means bringing together our partners in the Department of Defense, our US Cyber Command partners, our partners in the Intel community, the National Security Agency, our partners in the law enforcement community like our our great friends in the Federal Bureau of Investigation, bringing, bringing them all together so that we can make sure that we are aligning their operations and their talents and capabilities and authorities to support the nation's cyber defense activities. It also means being able to leverage the power of the federal government. So there are sector risk management agencies, and these are departments and agencies in the federal government that have very specific expertise about each of the critical infrastructure sectors. So the Energy uh, Department, Treasury, the Environmental Protection Agency, Health and Human Services, the Department of Transportation, the Transportation Security Administration, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, the Government Services Administration, all of these sector experts that come together lend incredible knowledge about how to operate uh, critical infrastructure. And then, of course, those on the front line, the actual critical infrastructure owners and operators can come to the table as well, share that planning expertise so we can come together and develop real plans to enable us to defend the nation in cyber. And on that note, I am also very, very excited to announce our initial set of key partners in the JCDC. CrowdStrike, Palo Alto, FireEye, Microsoft, Google, Amazon Web Services, AT&T, Verizon, and Lumen have all chosen to work with the federal government in the JCDC to help us come together and plan against the most serious cyber threats to the nation. Our two initial focus areas, uh, first one won't surprise you, uh, efforts to combat ransomware. The second one is efforts to develop a planning framework uh, to respond to cyber incidents on cloud providers. So we're very, very excited about the JCDC. Uh, if you are interested in joining us, please let us know. We really want to partner together for the collective defense of the nation. So that was thing one. Thing two, help us build the cyber workforce of today and tomorrow. Everybody knows the statistics by this point in time. 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs around the world, some 500,000 here in the US. In my personal view, this needs to be a highly ambitious national effort to be able to build the cybersecurity workforce to, to deal with the highly digitized world that we live in. Let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing at CISA in case it gives you some ideas to partner with us or to do some things on your own to help with this problem. First, we have great relationships with academia as a path to a cybersecurity career. In particular, we partner uh, with our federal government partners for the scholarship to take advantage of the scholarship for service, which provides scholarships to students for cybersecurity careers in exchange for government service. And I got to meet with a bunch of our interns last week. And if you met with them, you would be pretty excited about the future of cybersecurity. Um, but I think pro programs like this really need to be scaled significantly. We're also doing a lot of work in the K through 12 space, which is important to me as a mom. Uh, we help build cybersecurity curricula. We've provided it to 26,000 teachers around the country, helping to impact uh, and influence 3 million students. Uh, next year, we are aggressively focusing on providing the curricula to Title I schools, uh, to students with disabilities, and to historically black colleges and universities. Very excited about that. So that's the academic pathways. Two, reskilling. So we are working on a program to provide 
training to uh, federal professionals who are not cybersecurity people, who want to be entry-level cybersecurity people and putting them through a 12-month training program. I think this is really important, really outside the federal government as well. If you think about how many people lost their jobs over the past 18 months due to COVID and the need we have for cybersecurity professionals. So I think this is one program that we should figure out how to scale, not just for government, but outside of government as well, these reskilling, retraining opportunities. Three, we just issued a grant last week to nonprofits who are interested in identifying and developing unrealized cyber talent in our underserved communities. Now, a particular passion of mine is developing diverse organizations. I honestly believe that organizations that we build, particularly in technology and cybersecurity, must reflect the incredible diversity of our nation. Diversity in gender, in ethnicity, in sexual orientation, in education, in background, all translates into diversity of thought. And that helps us solve our most complicated puzzles better and faster. That incredible diversity helps us be able to address these problems much more collaboratively and effectively. So the fourth thing, we just issued a cybersecurity workforce guide. And essentially what this is, is an interactive guide for Federal, federal workers, they can download it and look for no-cost opportunities for professional development. So the whole idea is we make cybersecurity careers more accessible so that more people can see themselves in cyber. And then finally, another thing I am super excited about, we are hosting uh, the President's Cup Cybersecurity Competition for the third year in a row. Shall we compete? Registration open August 2021. All right, I didn't subject you to my awkward Elaine dance at that point in time. Um, but this is actually really exciting. I hope you get a chance to see my teammate Harry Mortos's presentation on the President's Cup Cyber Competition. Essentially, what this does is it tries to identify the best cyber talent in the federal government, uh, from the military to civilian, coming together to compete uh, on labs and virtual exercises. Uh, and we outsource, these are all open source uh, available. So if you wanna do something similar, uh, hold competitions, uh, or challenges, you can use all of that information to build your own. But we are very excited about our third year of the competition. Uh, so check it out and join uh, if you can. So these are just a few examples what we're doing uh, of what we're doing at CISA to help build the cyber workforce. But as I said at the outset, I believe we need to be much, much more ambitious about this and innovative about figuring out how to inform and educate and really inspire the next generation of cybersecurity professionals from the youngest of ages. You know, that will both inspire these diverse pipelines of cybersecurity professionals, but it will also help give people the knowledge they need to defend themselves in this very complicated cyber threat environment. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a bit of a space nut. And I really believe we need to treat this problem like the pioneers of space did decades ago. Again, a national ambitious effort. And I'm tracking a couple cool things that are out there, uh, but I hope to learn more. A couple things that I know of, um, uh, it, creating a cyber core akin to the Peace Corps. Efforts by the New America Foundation and Cyber Florida to focus on cyber citizenship, essentially to create resilience to online threats, misinformation, and disinformation. Uh, a great program by the National Cyber Scholarship Foundation that has set aside $2 million in scholarships for high school students and college students don't need any cybersecurity background at all. They play a game at cyberstartamerica.org, starts in October, to see if they have that highly technical talent needed to succeed uh, in cybersecurity. And the whole idea is to be able to create 25,000 uh, high-end, highly, te highly technical cyber professionals by the year 2025. So if you're interested, uh, or if you know folks who are interested, if your kids are interested, uh, play the game. Uh, 800 scholarships have already been given, and it won't surprise you that the students who've won scholarships are the puzzlers and 
uh, those who are really good at games like Minecraft. So these are just a few ideas. Again, we need to be super ambitious. Bring us your best ideas. Let's build the cyber workforce together. And then finally, help us secure the cyber ecosystem by joining Team CISA. Not only will you get to work on very challenging problems, but you'll get to work with an amazing set of colleagues in a culture that prizes collaboration and teamwork and trust and transparency and ownership and empowerment and innovation and inclusion. My goal is to make CISA the world's premier cyber and infrastructure defense agency. I ask you, I invite you to join me in that important endeavor. We're on the front lines of some of the most important and challenging and fascinating work there is from hunting on networks for suspicious activity to identifying vulnerabilities and in critical infrastructures to building a modern and defensible federal cyber ecosystem to working with our state and local officials to help secure election infrastructure to being on the front lines of the largest cyber incident response in federal history in the wake of solar winds. Pretty incredible mission to be a part of. And you'll be with exceptional teammates. One great program uh, from last year was we were able to bring in experts from the private sector as part of the CARES Act to help with the COVID response. So one teammate, Kendra Martin, joined us from the private sector uh, and has coordinated a multi-agency effort to help protect the COVID-19 vaccine supply chain from development to shipping to distribution. Kendra answered the call to her nation as, and has helped to make us collectively safer. So again, being a part of Team CISA means really challenging and fun problems, uh, really great teammates in a collaborative culture where you get to use your imagination every single day. Now behind me is a QR code. Uh, you will probably know that the federal government does not have the easiest process to navigate for hiring. So we are trying to change that. I'm very focused on this issue. But if you see that QR code there, and I promise you this is not a Rick roll, you can go to that QR code and you can submit your resume to come be part of Team CISA. So I ask you to think about doing that or provide that QR code to a friend who you think would be a great addition to our CISA teammates. Now I get it. Many of you have awesome jobs and that's terrific and you don't want to join Team CISA at this point, so keep your options open, but you may want to join uh, and do some other things to help us secure the cyber ecosystem. Uh, you may want to join the critical infrastructure sector as a cyber expert. You may want to be a mentor in your local community for students who are interested in careers in cyber. You can help us by being a cyber evangelist, using your expertise to help people understand all of the basics that we need to do to secure our systems and our networks. We know that over 90% of successful cyber attacks start with a phishing email. So it's the basics of cyber hygiene, multi-factor authentication, strong passwords, keeping your software updated, patching your vulnerabilities. These basics can really help us strengthen the security of the ecosystem. So help us get the word out on that. And then finally, if you're a business leader um, or working with your CEO, or if you're a CEO, make sure that you are treating cybersecurity, not the purview of the IT girls, but rather as a significant business risk. It's incredibly important that businesses from the highest level make cybersecurity a top priority from the board level and that they empower and resource and ensure that your CISOs are getting what they need to effectively defend the network. Help us get that word out as well, because that's incredibly important. Now, this is not an exhaustive set of ideas, but it's really a starting point for our conversation around a partnership. Now, in closing, we've talk a bit, talked a bit about some of the challenges in cyber, but we've done a lot of work to this point. I mean, we should be pretty proud of ourselves of what we've been able to accomplish, but we also need to be very pragmatic. This is, frankly, a generational issue and somewhat of a persistent problem. But if we work together, if we collaborate together, we can raise that cybersecurity baseline and reduce that risk. 
Now, throughout a career in cybersecurity and counterterrorism, I always get the same question. Jen, what keeps you up at night? But I prefer to reframe that question. It's not what keeps me up at night. It's what wakes me up in the morning. And that is the opportunity to work in a fantastic agency with incredibly talented teammates on one of the most important missions to our national security and the opportunity to solve some of our most complicated and important puzzles. So I invite you to come partner with us for the collective cyber defense of our nation to help us defend today and secure tomorrow. Thanks very much for your time and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you for your uh, opening comments, Jen. Uh, I think they were pretty well received and I don't think there was a single topic you didn't cover. <laughs> so, <laughs> fantastic. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but we, I do have some questions for you and hopefully I will have time to get a question from the audience as well. Um, so, first off, thank you. And I think one of the cornerstones around what you're asking is sort of uh, the mutual trust between the government and civil society or government and, and business. And so um, trust is always sort of on short supply, especially over the last few years. What, what is sort of your strategy uh, or how are you going to approach, how do you build trust with this community? I mean, you have to demonstrate your skill and you have to demonstrate trust. What are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, thanks so much for the opportunity. I'm sorry I was not able to be out there in person, uh, hopefully next year, but it's been a, um, a great honor to be a part of Black Hat. You, you know, you're absolutely right. I think the foundation for any ability to effectively collaborate is building that trust. And frankly, Jeff, it's why I took a little bit of time at the front end so that people understand more about me because mm -hmm. I think it's hard to trust somebody that you don't know. Yeah. And it's really the foundation of why we wanted to put together this joint cyber defense collaborative so we could bring together key government partners with our key private sector partners who I have such an appreciation for having just spent the last four and a half years in the private sector. I think if you work closely to, together, if you solve problems together, um, you really be, you, you are able to create that trust. And, you know, sometimes it's getting a beer with somebody or talking over um, personal topics that helps to build that. So I think it's the foundation of any successful relationship, whether it's uh, your marriage uh, or, a, uh, or a collaboration uh, with your partner. So no. trust is, is foundational. Yeah, I think it's really important because some people in government want you to trust the organization, but in reality, researchers, we trust people. Right? You trust people, you don't necessarily trust organizations. And so, so that's really important that you're trying to, to identify who you are and what you believe in. And so, so my next question then is, one of the big pitfalls um, people run into is the going dark debate, right? It's really polarizing. And, and this sort of false dichotomy of privacy versus security, and it's not possible to have both at the same time. So DHS has done a pretty good job of steering clear of the going dark debate but it's gonna be asked of you at some point. So any, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking the question because I know it's hugely important, um, not just to this audience, but really to everybody. You know, Having spent the past four and a half years as a private citizen, I have a strong view on this. And that's, you know, in particular as the CISA director, um, that we have to have strong encryption to be able to ensure the defense of our networks. Uh, it's foundational, and as everybody in this audience knows. So um, I realize that there are other points of view across the government, but I think as the CISA director and me personally, uh, I think strong encryption is absolutely fundamental for us to be able to do what we need to do. Right on. Woo! Um, and so my final question before I go to the audience real quick is, what do you think of your right mix of talent? You, you talked about it briefly, you know, it's sort of like you're adapting to this new world. Do you think with these new authorities, you're going to be able to get the right talent or people are, are interested in, in serving the country uh, through DHS? Or do you think that the pool of private sector is too great? No, I mean, I, I think I'm going to be relentlessly focused on this. Um, so, you know, if I don't, if I don't get it done, I, it won't be for lack of effort. 
Uh, the government hiring process is Byzantine and uh, really kind of a mess. And, you know, as much as we're able to bring in great talent for people who want to defend their country and to be part of this incredible mission, there is a huge competition out there. And so we're going to do a couple things. First of all, there's we're going to be implementing shortly the cyber talent management system. And I hope that that will help uh, bring in people because you'll be able to pay, pay closer to market. Um, I am personally going to work with my team uh, to be able to accelerate the hiring process. I am really, really focused on that. And also to look for opportunities where we can bring people in from the private sector. It doesn't need to be a career, but bring, bring people in for a year, two years to really help strengthen the connective tissue between public and private. So I think we need to look for creative ideas. I'm also looking to bring in a chief people officer uh, who can help me create that talent management ecosystem. Uh, but also, as I think we both appreciate, Jeff, to build that culture that I talked about of collaboration and teamwork and ownership and empowerment and trust, the trust and transparency piece, I think are so incredibly important. I'm, I'm just happy that you called it uh, a chief person officer and not a human capital officer. Yeah, that was purposeful. Yes. That was purposeful. <laughs> right on. Okay, let's have time. Let's a question from the audience. If anybody where I can see you have a question, I'll ask it if it's not crazy. Uh, I'll take crazy questions. Oh. <laughs> okay, crazy right here. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, your um, the question is: How would you draw a distinction between yourself and your predecessor, uh, Director Krebs, in maybe your, your style or approach or, or new vision uh, in the direction of the of the department? I think Chris did a fantastic job. Right. He founded the agency. He shepherded it. Uh, shepherded it through a really turbulent time, the election period, uh, COVID, and uh, I just, I think the world of Chris Krebs and he remains uh, a great friend. I think there's the, the founder, right? And then there's the next CEO that comes in and transforms, continues the transformation of the organization. So I'm gonna be focused on how do we put the right processes in place to be able to take CISA into our next five and 10 years. And so I think our styles are similar. He has many more Twitter followers than I do, um, but we have similar senses of humor and we're both, we're both um, really focused on taking care of people and making sure that as we do the mission, we're creating great partnerships and also having a lot of fun doing it. So, um, so I hope to build on Chris's great work and I hope to partner with uh, everybody there to, to help make CISA uh, the, the agency that the nation deserves. Fantastic. All right, well, thank you so much. Let's give Jen a round of applause. And look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you, everyone.